indebted to someone, how far do you let that go? Like, say you get a flat tire and it also bends the rim on your car. You just paid all your bills and you don't get paid until the end of next week. Your friend bums, bums you some cash, you get everything fixed, and now you're indebted to your friend. Now, of course, you're gonna pay them back, but how indebted to them are you? Is it just the cash amount? Or does the timing and the importance of their help also count? Say you pay them back and a week later, they ask you to help them move. Would you do it? All right, well then let's say that you had plans that weekend. Would you feel obligated to cancel your plans just to help them move? Let's say that you do that, but two weeks later they ask to borrow some money from you. Do you still feel obligated to help them out? And if so, where's the line where you say no? How do you know when to draw that line? Now let's say that they gave you control of the most powerful entity on the planet. What if they handed you the papacy? What if they made you Pope? Are you indebted to them then? Because at that point you're a physical representation of God on earth. So can you even be indebted to anyone? I mean, God certainly doesn't know any, owe anybody anything. But at the same time, you wouldn't be Pope without them. See, this is the quandary that Pope Sergius III finds himself to be in. So we don't know a lot about Sergius because during this time of Rome, we're at the end of the ninth century. Things are chaotic at best and a lot of records about him were destroyed but Sergius is believed to be from a noble Roman family many people believe that he was directly descended from the first of the Count Kardashian clan of Tusculum Sergius is nominated through the ranks and he seems to progress perfectly fine He's definitely with the preppy kids, though, if you catch my drift. And everything's going smoothly until Pope Formosus. Now, remember that name. Because that name, oh my god, that name comes into play in later episodes. In doing the research for this that I've done, I've not found a more hated man than Pope Formosus. And see, he's where everything changes. See, Sergius is a member of the party who support the emperor. The emperor and Formosus oppose each other, and they really do not get along. Now, Central Italy at the time is a hot mess. Sergius isn't helping matters by stirring the pot. So Formosus consecrates Sergius as bishop of Ciari. And he does this simply to get rid of him. Formosus wants him gone. But because Sergius is cool with everybody and has a little bit of power, Formosus takes a political move to this and consecrates him as bishop and gets him out of town. He figures that's the best way to deal with him. But when Formosus dies, all of his acts are declared null and void. And the next couple years after Formosus' death, the papacy changes hands more than Diddy changes names. Sorry, Puffy. Sorry, Puff Dad. Sorry, New York, whatever his name is. But here's a prime example. The next four popes all serve less than a year except for one. One was 15 days, 
One was about three months. The one that lasted longer than a year only did so by a couple months. And then Pope Theodore II comes along, but he was only Pope for 20 days. And when he dies, Sergius takes a small group of the Roman nobility and he strolls into Rome. He tries to have himself elected as Pope. He does this, though, against the wishes of the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the emperor was someone that he backed. But the emperor already has a guy picked out. And he wants this guy placed as Pope. So, the cardinals vote, and guess what happens? Both are elected Pope. See, Sergius wins his election, but the emperor's guy, John, also wins. And the tie-breaking vote is, you guessed it, the emperor. So the emperor's guy is seated. He becomes John the Ninth, and his first order of business was to excommunicate Sergius and anyone who followed him. Now, as we've talked about before, if you're excommunicated at this time... You're in for a bad life. But for some reason, this doesn't really happen to Sergius. See, he's excommunicated, but the emperor goes so far as to forcibly banish him out of Rome and back to Siari, where he was bishop. And when I say forcibly, I don't mean that they showed up and in a stern voice, they waved their finger and they said, you got to go. And he said, all right, guys, sure, it's been fun and I'll, I'll catch you on the flip. No, troops showed up to remove him. And so he sent back to where he came from. But as everything is at this time in Rome... Nothing's permanent. And Sergius is a coyote, and he's wily. So the first thing he does when he gets back to Ciara is he meets with the noble family that's in control of the area and convinces them to place him under their protection just to make sure nobody comes along and tries to push this whole deal any further. So a couple years go by, and... The anti-pope Christopher takes the, th the throne of St. Peter by force. Don't ask. I know. It's a whole thing. Thus the whole anti part. Anyway. He takes the papacy. But Rome has changed. There's a new emperor. And the emperor has stationed someone that is Sergius' friend. As in control of Rome. And the emperor leaves. So when the coast is clear, Sergius' friend gathers up all the noble families in Rome and revolts against Christopher, the anti-pope. And as they begin to see that they're going to win and Christopher is captured and thrown in jail, Sergius gets the call to come back to Rome and take over as pope. And of course he accepts. Why wouldn't he? That's what he always wanted. So, with the noble family that was protecting him, he strolls into Rome. And when he gets there, he walks straight in and is immediately elected Pope. Now, his friend's name is Theo. That's not his entire name. But if I try it, I'm going to butcher it. And so, for the sake of the story, from now on, he's Theo. And Theo is the sole reason... Sergius is Pope. Theo was left in the top position by the emperor. He was primed to do whatever he pleased with that power. And he pleased Sergius to be Pope. And Sergius is a smart dude because he's very aware of this. So the first thing he does is he gives Theo a job that is the most important top job he can possibly give him in the Roman Catholic Church. He basically makes him the treasurer slash chief of staff. 
rolled into one. So, like, you know how they say that the chief of staff to the president is the most powerful person in Washington because he decides who gets access to the president and who doesn't. Well, imagine that, but he also controls the entire treasury. That's the position he gives Theo. And from this moment on, everything that we talk about, everything that happens, has to be viewed through a lens of, was this Sergius or Theo making the call? Because some will say that he just became a puppet to Theo, and maybe he did. Like, prime example, the two previous popes before him are both strangled to death, while in prison during the same year. Most people blame Sergius for that, saying that he gave the order. And he may have. But it's far more likely that the militant-minded Theo either gave the order or, to or told Sergius to give the order. So I'll let you decide how you think that went down. But now we have Pope Sergius III, and he's ready to get to work. And what's the first thing he does? Well, he calls a synod, or a meeting as we now know, and he annuls all the positions that Formosus had granted. Like I said, remember that name because this episode, and especially the next episode, this dude's going to come up a lot. He also requires all the bishops who were ordained by Formosus to come back to Rome and be reordained. And he does this without a single argument from the Synod. And this is particularly odd because this rule pisses people off bad. And for there to be no objections, there has to be a reason. And there was. We find out that Sergius had no objections to this because he threatened some people. He threatened them with exile. He threatened them with violence. Some he just outright bribed. But those that are bishops outside of Rome are furious. They let it, know, no, they let it be known how ridiculous this whole thing is. And how big of a pain it's going to be for them to travel all the way back to Rome to have a do-over. Because you have to remember, they're walking speed at this point. So, you know, they're hundreds of miles away. This could take weeks to get into Rome just to have a do-over. So, some of the bishops just outright ignore him. And instead of coming back to Rome, they write letters justifying the validity of their positions and claiming how ridiculous this whole thing is. And now, if this isn't making him any friends, well, Sergius III's getting ready to really piss off the rest of the people. I mean, he's doing a full-on for those in the back. So he takes everything a step further. And he shows how much he truly hates Formosus. I told you, that name's going to keep coming up. He openly and officially honors Pope Stephen VI. Now, I have to, I have, to have a sidebar here. I'm going to do my best not to mention his name again. And to do so, I'm going to have to skip over some of Sergius' time as Pope. Because Stephen the Sixth is the next episode. And he is by far my favorite bad Pope because the things he does are just outright batshit crazy. There's no other term for it. He's nuts. So I'm going to sidestep this part and put a pin in it because in the next episode, when I when I discuss him, I'll come back and fill in the Sergius role in all this. But what I will say is that the members of the clergy are none too happy that he's being honored by the Pope. For 
surges to do this would be the equivalent of Pope Francis, our current Pope, holding a ceremony where he praises and honors Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, it's like that. So at this time, neither Sergius nor Theo are too fond of the emperor. He's already pissed off basically the entire church. And they don't really like the emperor that's in charge, but they have a problem. The next in line for the job, they see is weak. His name's Beringer I of Italy. And... As Italy's sliding into complete chaos, he's repeatedly told by the Pope to calm things down or to strip certain families of their nobility and to put things back in control. And he keeps repeatedly showing he's not capable of doing this. He even goes so far with this as a certain noble family start acting up and flaunting the fact that they had taken papal territory from Pope John. And Sergius writes them directly and tells them to knock it off. They don't. So he sends word to the bishop in the area that Beringer's at and basically says, look, if Beringer ever wants to be the emperor, he's going to have to show me that he can handle something like this because if he can't calm them down and take the lands back from them, I'm never putting the crown on him. So he finds himself in a, a, a very sticky situation. He's not fond of the emperor he has, but the replacement is no good. So he and Theo, for the most part, kind of stick with the devil you know. It's the best thing they can do at the time. And so it's exactly what they do do. Now... Not to be an underachiever, Sergius III also stirs up trouble elsewhere. He's already pissed off the entire church. Why not make it the world? So, he calls a synod to basically attack the beliefs of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. And I'm going to hit this quick because this is kind of this is why but not really type situation that he picks a fight with the emperor of the byzantine empire who is a part of the holy roman empire but basically it goes like this in 325 the nicene creed is agreed upon and becomes the ruling belief structure of the catholic religion of christianity and thus the world at the time well, in 381, the creed gets a rewrite. You know, just a second draft, just to brush it up a little. Now, this is what all of Christian faith is built on. It's what helps decide what books eventually go into the Bible and which don't. And the rewrites really are just kind of fleshing stuff out. Like, in the 325 creed... The crucifixion of Christ is basically one line. It just says that he suffered, he died, was buried, rose on the third day, and ascended to heaven. The end. But they need to bump up the sexy, because that's kind of flat. So, what do they do? Well, they go from the one flat line to, in 381... We get the addition of Pontius Pilate and the line that he ascended to sit at the right of the Father. So around 350 years after these things happened, if you believe that they did, and 56 years after the first flat sentence was agreed upon, they decide to give it a rewrite, and this is what they do. Now, a lot of this is just adding and where there's a comma you know, or a few words here, just really nothing more than to spice it up. Because they need it spicy so that people will read it and follow it. But the big thing that comes out of this, the major point that comes out of the 381 revision, is they come out of the writer's room with the idea that Jesus, the Holy Ghost, and God are all made of the same thing. 
And they're all the same. And this is big. Because this changes the entire dynamic of what the Christian religion is. And the Western countries seem to roll with the rewrites, but the Eastern countries prefer to stick with old school. So Sergius basically writes Constantinople and says that he's been busy, he hasn't had time to address this, but he does now and it's been pissing him off. And he's decided that if they don't accept the new stance on the Holy Ghost, he's going to have to bring the pain. Because they're all being sacrilegious. And if they don't fall in line, he's bringing the thunder. Now, why was he doing this? In reality, it had nothing to do with the, the creed. It had nothing to do with their belief in Christianity. It had nothing to do with any of that. He's actually doing this because the emperor of the Byzantine Empire wants to get married for a fourth time. And the patriarch of Constantinople, like the head religious figure, won't allow it. And so the emperor writes to Sergius, and Sergius approves it. And when he does, the emperor then deposes the patriarch who blocked it as revenge, and he then goes to the pope and complains that he's been thrown out for no reason. Thus, Sergius stirring the pot with Constantinople. But nothing really comes of that. Now, while this is happening and toward the end of his papacy, there's a rumor that comes out. Now, it doesn't come out at the time. In fact, the two historians of the time who were not fans of Sergius never mentioned this at all. It did 50 years later before this is mentioned. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to preface this with this is rumor, but you know. So Sergius' old pal Theo has a daughter. And it's rumored that Sergius has an affair with said daughter until she meets a nobleman and gets married to another noble family. But she has a son. And... Normally at this time, it would make sense for her to have had an affair with the Pope because that would bring the Pope in line with her family. It would elevate her family. They would have some dirt on the Pope and they therefore would have some control. But in this scenario, they don't really need that because Theo has all the control you could want. He's the one that put Sergius III on the throne. But she goes on to have a son. And this is where the idea that maybe they had an affair, maybe the child is his, this is where it gains traction. During this time, if you were a part of a noble family, if you were the firstborn son, your life was spent preparing to take over the role that your father had because you had wealth, you had lands, you, you know, you're not going to give those up. So you're raised and groomed to take his position. You would definitely never go into the church. That's just not something you would do. Well, that's what happens. Her son, her firstborn son, goes into the church, and the secondborn takes over the father's position, which is kind of fishy. And oddly enough, her firstborn son goes on to become pope. Yeah, I know. Kind of odd. But anyway, like I said, that's, that's rumor. We don't have any direct evidence of that. But it's still kind of fun to dig into. But anyway, Pope Sergius III dies in 9-11. And... His legacy is basically that he's a vile man who used military might to deal with small problems and small groups that opposed him. They say that he existed during 
the highlight of the pornocra pornocracy when basically the, the Vatican was used as a whorehouse and he wasn't the only one, but he definitely was in on it. Um, and ultimately he goes down as being the guy who is known for killing his two predecessors and having an affair with Theo's daughter. Like that's the legacy he left because again, everything that he did, we have to question on who was actually calling the shots because he was indebted to a friend. So I'll ask you again. How do you know when to draw the line when you're indebted to a friend? And at what point do you just become a puppet? I'll let you decide. So I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, the support has been amazing to my European listeners. Thank you so much. You guys have been amazing. Um, I'm going to try to have the next episode up later this week and you are not going to want to miss it because it is a doozy. He is by far my favorite. He's nuts. And you're, you're, I, I assure you, if there's one episode to make sure you listen to, it'll be the next one. But as always, if you're listening on YouTube, like and subscribe, um, buy some merch share the show if you can both of those things help out a lot and I think that's it yeah alright well then until next week I've been David Van Dyke and I will see you next week